I preached my heart out and I knew and I thought, man, well, there's nobody listening here. Nobody, you know. And here's how I gave the invitation. If there's anybody here who wants to get saved, you can. Come on up. God has got to deal with you. There's a woman holding a baby. She laid that baby down and just like kind of slid across the pew a little bit and run and fell at my feet, screaming and hollering. She needed to get saved if she wasn't saved. And that taught me a lesson. I don't care what goes on, the Holy Spirit of God can do things. Because I see when we get saved at a football game. I mean, that's just how it works. Now, what is sanctification? It's knowing the position that you live in. You look in your bullet a little bit. It's knowing our position in Christ. It will change your life. If you assume that position, I want to tell you, on the authority of God's Word, it will change your life. Your life will never be the same once you assume that position that I'm a Christian. I've been saved by the grace of God. I'm a child of God. I'm a citizen of heaven. It'll change your life on how you live, what you say, what you do, what you don't do, and what you should be doing. It'll change it all. And that's why that's we have to understand that. It, it, it'll change your life. Jesus overcame this. Surely He could help us overcome sin in our life. I mean, you think about that. He conquered death. I, I don't care what sin you've done, unless it's against the Holy Spirit, you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. The Bible says you cannot be saved of that, that, of that sin in this world or the world to come. And if, you, and if you've ever done it, you probably won't live 24 hours. So, and a Christian can't do it. It's impossible for a Christian to do it. A Christian can't do it. So and this is what we have to know that his death on the cross was sufficient for my sin and forgiveness. It's then it, the, him coming out of the grave is to show me and, the, and, and to, to let me see that there's power for me to overcome sin in my life. That I don't have to live in it all the time. There's something wrong with a, a person who calls herself a Christian and lives in the sin all the time. There's something sad, sad, bad, bad, wrong with that. And I'm talking about myself. When, when it comes to, I have to, I want to tell you I go to a spring lane, I, I get convicted. I, I'm just doing it. I do. I, it, it bothers me. I was with a preacher one time. We were going to preach at some old churches. Uh, we were traveling then. I had about four churches that I was involved in. And I was kind of traveling the circuit. Preacher with him coming, and uh, we'd stop and got set up eight between one church and another church. We're going down the road. He just gets that bag of stuff that we was eating because we was eating on the run. We got to, he just got to go down the road, throw it out the window, and stopped. I said, You get out and go get that. I said, That's a sin to do that. Did you know after that day he never spoke to me again? Because he didn't think it was a sin. He didn't. He said, that ain't no good sin. I said, yes it is. It's a sin to throw paper out in your vehicle. Throw it in your yard. Throw it in your, in your house. Throw it in your car. Or whatever. But it's a sin how we littered up and destroyed this country. It's a sin for us to do it. But people do it. You know, they don't think about it. So how do I know about sanctification. The Bible says that His Word, the Bible, helps us to be sanctified. Because we read it, oh, I'm not sure we be doing it. Oh, I should be doing it. So sanctification is an ongoing process. I was lost. I am saved. That's said. That's done. That's a one-shot done deal. The Bible teaches in Hebrews that if you worship the fall again, you could never be saved again. If you don't believe me, just read Hebrews chapter 6. Because here's what you would say. You would say, Jesus, you're dead on the cross. It wasn't sufficient. It wasn't strong enough. That's what you're saying. The Bible says you put him to an open shame. Read Hebrews chapter 6. It will tell you that. It's not what I, it's not what I made up. It's what the Bible says. On it. it says you could never be saved again. Because here's why. Let's say you could get lost. And then you want to get saved again. God would look around and say, I'm sorry, there's nothing else up here. My son just died one time for you. If that wasn't good enough, if that's not strong enough, it, there is nothing in this heaven, nothing. It's, the Bible says it's impossible to be 
be saved again. So that's sin. Was lost. Salvation is sin. Now, I am being justified. That means as, as I, uh, sin is revealed in my life, the Holy Spirit of God has helped me overcome that. How do I know that? Let's look at the Bible, what it says on Look at uh, Romans chapter 1, verse, chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? The question is why he's asking that. He just said to a bunch of people, grace, as sin did abound, grace did much more abound. So they're thinking, well, then the more I sin, then the more grace will abound. That was their attitude. They misinterpreted the Bible. That was what he was saying. Because grace overcomes great sins. That's all he's saying, okay? So look at verse 2. Shall, shall we do it? He says, What God forbid that we would live like that license. How shall we that are dead in sin live any longer therein? We abuse the grace of God. If we're not careful, you can abuse the grace of God. And we better be careful about that, how we abuse that. Just because I'm saved doesn't give me permission to do what I want to do or to do what, or do what you want to do. And I've actually known people and said that, well, I'm a Christian, I do what I want to. That is the most ungodly thing that you can say because what you're saying is, I don't want God's guidance in my life. I don't want the Holy Spirit to guide me. I want to do what I want to do. That's the world. That's, that's right out of Satan's playbook to get people to do that. So I can't do what I want to do. I'm, I'm preaching to me the best they have anybody here. So we will kill our testimony, and that, and that is very hard to overcome. If, you come, if you're not assuming, you're assuming the position as a Christian, I mean really, really assuming that position, and you live your life close to what the world was doing, you've killed your testimony, and I want to say to you, and let me hear what's in my this building, you're going to kill, you, you have no influence with the lost world. And we better wake up to that. The church of the living God better wake up back. We better, if we're going to say we're Christians, we better start acting like we're Christians. We better start living like we're Christians. We better assume that position. Because if we don't, it's hard to overcome. I had a brother-in-law, he, uh, he told me he's passed away now and he got killed by a drunk driver. And uh, he told me one time he's, he was stationed in some place, he was in Air Force, he was stationed some way out of place in Greenland or Iceland, I can't remember which one. Which one has ice in all the time? Greenland? I think it's backwards. If you say Greenland means it has more ice than Iceland. I don't make any sense, but I think that's the way it works. But anyway, he was stationed up there. And he said, we could get beer any time on. He said, I didn't drink and I was a Christian. I was trying to, you know, live the way Christian life and everything. He said, we run out of water. He said, I went to brush my teeth. And he said, I took the beer out of that case and hid it. He went to the, to the bathroom. And he said, I, I was going to brush my teeth with it. He said, hey, it's sitting there on the sink. And one of the men that come in that I've been trying to witness to and tell about the Lord and trying to get him to get saved, come in and saw that. That one beer. And he said, he wouldn't believe that I just used to brush my teeth. He said, I lost my testimony with that man. I couldn't have, every time I wanted to bring him something there, I'd be reading the Bible. He'd say, you know, you're a great deal. I don't have everything else. See, that's what the Lord thinks of us. If you live like, like you're lost, the world will call you a hypocrite. That's why you can never aggravate me or get me discouraged. 
Because what I'm doing, I'm doing for the Lord. And every time I look at you and I'm around you, I treat you as though you belong to God, not me. So I, that's that. It just works out there. It, because while we're dead in that, how do I know that? So shoot, so look at verse 3 of this song. Know ye not? Do you, do you not know? Do you not remember? That so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. When you got baptized, here's what that represented. You identified with Jesus Christ. You're identified. When that's, that's the closest thing that God can give us on this earth to show us what we're supposed to be doing and how we're supposed to be doing. That's the closest thing that he can do to me to show that I've been saved. Besides killing me. And, and let me go into glory and get in the, the, the glorified body that's promised to me. When I got baptized, when you got baptized, you said to the world, world, I died out of you. Now when somebody dies and it happens, what do we do? We bury them, right? Do like this. Do I have to start over again? Come together. We bury people who die. They're out of this world now. When I went into the water and the watery grave that represented the watery grave, represented the grave, when I came back up out, that was showing that I had been born into a new lifestyle, a Christian lifestyle. So let me tell you something. If you claim to be a Christian and you're a baptized believer especially, and you're not assuming the position, if I'm not assuming the position, as a Christian, I'm a mockery to Jesus Christ. I'm, I am. I'm, you know, because what I identify with him. I remember, I'm, here's what Jesus said to me, here's what Jesus said to you as a Christian. I want y'all to come and help me do the ministry, do the kingdom work. I'm calling you to be a partner with me. I'm calling you to be that. We're considered really high uh, brothers of Jesus Christ. We've been born into the family of God. That's why he's called us, called us brother. And sisters, of course. But know, know you not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ. We're baptized into his death. That's what we're, we identify with Christ in this thing. Now look at verse 4. You get the word therefore. Remember every time that we see that word. Therefore, or wherefore, is always said, but it's always because of what was said before it. And what was said before it. We, we, what we've been baptized in, in the Jesus Christ. We've been identified with Jesus Christ. He says, therefore, we are buried with him by baptism, baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk what? In the newness of life. Here's what that's saying to me. Here's what that's saying to you. Here's what that's saying to, the, to every Christian. When you got saved, there ought to have been a change in your life so much that people could know that there's a change in your life. It, it ought to be a change. So much that people know it. Because then, uh, I have a room in my house. Nobody can bring any kind of alcoholic beverage in my house. No dope in my house. I don't care who it is. They cannot do it. I won't let them do it. My, I've had family on both sides of my family and in and outlaws or in-laws. Try to do that and I stop that door. They can't come in. Oh, come on, man. No. I don't want in we have a rule also about it. We let the kids, uh, we used to let, the, when we had TV and stuff on, we would say, when they start doing things bad on TV, somebody's got to cut it out. Everybody in my house had permission to get up and say, we're not watching that, and turn TV on. Because <laughs> we've let that just come in our lives so much and everything. That we don't think nothing about. 
See, some of y'all can remember when stores were closed on every Sunday and a half a day on Wednesday. How many of y'all remember stores closed on a half a day on Wednesday? Yeah. You know why they did that? Yeah. So people could go to a prayer meeting. When I was a little boy and going, our church was full on Wednesday night. They didn't have Bible teaching. They didn't have Bible preaching. They didn't have, you know what they did? They came and just prayed. That's all they did. Whenever, when you got through praying, you went home. That's how they got started, praying during the war. They started praying for the soldiers. I was a uh, pastor of church one time, and I was looking on when it was built, and looking at it, and I thought, that can't be right. That's just, there's something wrong with that. That cannot be right. They could not build that church there. It's got this big, huge church there. So I started asking the community. I said, y'all remember when that church was built? So I found some people who knew when it was being built. I found a woman who there when she was a little girl, helped carry bricks to it when she was a little girl. She said, they gave me a little sack, and I put that sack on my back, and, and when I couldn't carry one sack of bricks down, so I just put one or two in there to give me something to do as a little girl, and I carried bricks to it. I said, do you know when that was built? And she said, yeah, I know when it was built. I have built it as a little girl. I talked to the older people that was there, that was young, men, young women who helped build that church. And I said, and y'all built that church in that time. I said, how did you do it? I said, that was during World War II. You built it during World War II. Y'all built this building, this beautiful big church during World War II. Well, people couldn't get butter. Couldn't get anything. How did y'all get all the material to build this church during World War II? This woman looked at me and she said, I'll tell you how we did it, preacher. You see that hill out right there where that big white building is up there? That big old wooden building? Yeah. That used to be the church we met. But it started falling down. And she said, we got on our face before God and every day we prayed for God to help us relocate from up on the hill because we all had to walk up the hill to down here on this flat place. And we begged God and we cried out to God every day and, he's, and she said, that's how that church was built. Because God's people got down and God honored us. And he, and he helped us build that church during World War II. Who ever heard such a thing? When you couldn't get gas. You couldn't get, I mean, you had to have strip and stuff to get certain things. I heard my parents talk about it and everything else on the how bad it was. And they built this beautiful brick church. I mean, it's beautiful. Right near World War II. Because you know what? They were living for the Lord and God honored it. Amen. And do you think God will honor you if, if you sacrifice it? And then that, that we're, walking, we're supposed to walk in a unison life. That's the challenge that God's given us in His Word to walk in a unison life. Now, what's the end of this conclusion of this thing? Assume the position of the believer. That's the challenge for me. That's the challenge for you as Christians. I have to assume that position. If, if I'm going to call myself a Christian, I'll act like one. And you know what? You ought to expect me to as a pastor. You ought to expect me to. It doesn't mean that I'm always going to. Because you know what? I'm still in the flesh. Does it mean you're going to be burnt? You're still in the flesh. That's why sanctification is important to me. That position in Christ, because Christ died on the cross and He came out of the grave to show us His power to overcome the grave and overcome uh, any kind of sin that's in my life. He can help me overcome it if I just turn over to Him. I'm going to tell you this. I had a sin of. Uh, watching a, a TV program. My little girl was born and every day I come home at lunchtime and fed her until she was two years old. She was a little tiny thing that had taken, not a baby ball, but a doll baby ball. Y'all know what a doll baby ball is? They're about this big. Because my 
John Little Dog was so small, and we'd stick in her mouth and her little jaw would turn red. She'd suck so hard trying to get all that out of her. She, you know, she couldn't take the heat a whole lot and everything. And I'd sit there during uh, uh, lunchtime and feed her. And there's a TV program on called The Young and Precious. <laughs> While that was on there, I would watch that. For two years, I got a prior, we went and got a baby dog high chair, not a baby high chair. I went and bought a, a toy baby dog high chair and put it in, because that's how small she was. And feeding her, watching what was happening to Nikki and Victor. <laughs> <laughs>
I thank you for the salvation you've already said you've justified me, imputed unto me as righteousness. You can do that through what Jesus Christ has done. When you look at me, you look at me through the blood of Jesus Christ. What Jesus Christ has done. When I need help, I'm still in the flesh. I need to hold 